Stanford University. So I think I remember the first day of this class, the, the rule was try to come to all 10 lectures. And if you can't make it to all 10, then you can miss up to two. Well, I've got a list of like 15 people who have missed more than two already. And if, you're one of the, if you think you might be on that list, come chat with me. I'll probably send an email um, this week and find out what the story is behind those up to three or four absences. Um, but uh, there's sheets that will be going around. And uh, just another thing is trying to make sure they don't end up in the very back of the room where people can walk in and sign the sheet and then leave. We've, I've been witnessing that happening. So um, uh, Next week, we have Mike Kunjovitsky, who is a uh, designer and runs a design consultancy called Think, Thing M, I believe. And his, uh, he has an interesting title to his talk. Let's see, what is it? Uh, information is a material in products are services. So come next week and find out what that's about. Um, this week we have Tico Bayagas, who is a senior research scientist at Nokia Research in the IDEA group. And... Uh, be talking today about some work on supporting distant family communication and some of the interesting interfaces they've developed to, to do that. So, welcome. Thank you. So, uh, so, yeah. So, my name is Rafael Bayagas. My friends call me Tico. Um, here at Nokia Research Center in Palo Alto. So, it's right across the street. And um, this work, uh, Story Time for the 21st Century, is work that we've been doing in collaboration with Sesame Workshop. And Sesame Workshop's really been a great partner in this work. They have the, the expertise in early childhood education and content, and we're the connecting people experts, so we've really been able to create this synergistic relationship, and I'm really proud of the work that we've been able to do together. So, um, I should acknowledge that the work that I'll be presenting here is really based on a team effort. And so I'd, I'd like to recognize two of my team members who are sitting here today, Hayes, Raffle, and Miriana, who are sitting right behind you in full Halloween spirit over here. Um, and we're part of the IDEA team. IDEA stands for Innovate, Design, Experience, Animate. Animate as in bring to life. And that name really reflects the uh, user-centered design philosophy that we use and operate upon. Um, we also had many different interns and contractors that <coughs> helped collaborate in this work. And you'll see their names in some of the publications at the end of this talk. OK. So um, an outline for the talk today, it's pretty simple. Um, basically, what I'm going to do is try to paint a picture of the situation of family communication today. How are people? communicating with their distant family members at a distance. And then uh, based on our learnings from that, some solutions that we've created around connected reading. So connected reading is really reading books together at a distance. And we've created three prototypes that I'm going to talk about. First is family story play at the top. Uh, next is story visit, which is a web-based version. And then finally, people in books. OK, so uh, family communication today. So on a personal note, um, I am actually expecting my first child. My wife and I are expecting our first child uh, in January. Of, of the, so upcoming very quickly. And uh, my parents have already expressed some anxiety uh, about being part of their first grandchild's life, because they live 3,000 miles away across the country, and they're not really sure how they're going to be able to connect with their grandchild as much as they'd like to. And this is a pain point that we saw for many different families. This is not just us. A lot of families feel the pain of distance and want to be more connected, but they just don't have the tools to do it yet. 
So uh, when we went into this research, we really wanted to focus on three main questions. First of all, what does family mean, right? So what are people's different definitions of family? There's a, a huge variety in what people consider family. Um, next, how do families communicate, both with their extended family and with others, but also among themselves? What do they do to uh, communicate with each other? And then lastly, of course, since we're a technology company, what are the opportunities for new technologies to address some of these needs? Okay. So uh, we started um, with a study of 18 families in uh, the Bay Area where we would actually go into their homes and, and do observations about how they communicate today. And so these sessions were typically three to four hours of open-ended interviews. And we also did uh, activities with the kids, like a tour of their room. Um, we did had a people in my life activity where they drew their families. Um, we had interviews with the parents where we asked about their attitudes towards technology and different ways that kids were using technology in their life. And of course, the most important part here is we wanted to observe a typical call to a remote family member. And we were, we were very um, unspecific in how this call should be carried out. They could do it with whoever, whatever family member they wanted to, using whatever technologies they wanted as well. And so let me give you a taste for a typical encounter. And I'm going to need the audio here, so. This house. JP, do you want to call anybody? Nope. Nope? I just want to hit somebody. Yeah. Well, that's good. Hey, <laughs> 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 I think that boys have literally like this testosterone thing. You just so that's typically what we were walking into. And uh, to give you kind of a further taste, um, some typical demographics here. So um, it turns out that the average age of first-time grandparents is 48 years old. So it's actually a lot younger than most people think, right? And it kind of changes your perception of what types of things are possible with this, with this community. Also, 45% um, of grandparents live more than 200 miles away from their grandchildren. So that's a pretty significant number. And these are the people that are experiencing this, this pain of distance. OK, so um, moving on, the people in my life activity. So these are the um, children's drawings and representations of people in their life. We asked the kids to draw out people who were important to them. Parents and siblings usually made the list, but not always. <laughs> um, we had, for example, friends in the list, including in the top right, we had uh, a boy with autism who drew his counselor uh, in the picture as well. Uh, we also had extended family, so like aunts, grandparents. Um, we had, of course, pets. Um, kids very much consider pets to be part of their family. Um, and in some cases, even parents could seem remote. So here's a picture of a dad working at the office in the family picture. And what's great about all of these pictures is all the personal touches that you see here. So like uh, favorite outfits and, and nails recently done. And so you get a really perspective of how kids see the world through these things. OK, so um, back to observing this communication. Um, so it turns out that uh, although we didn't specify any particular technology, 88% of the families that we observed chose to use the phone as their primary way of keeping in touch. And this was fraught with problems, especially with younger kids. And here's an example of how one of those conversations would typically go. 
Cars. 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 Definitely not working as a team. We're talking over each other. We're young at each other. Say bye bye, Titi. Say we love you. Say we love you. So there's there's a couple of things that this this child was really good at. He was really good at expressing himself physically through like kissing the phone and caressing it with his face. And he was also really good at manipulating the physicality and uh, the affordances of the physical device. So he was able to close it up and hang up on the remote party at the end. But uh, you'll notice also that he needed a lot of help in different ways. And so his mother was helping him with things to say. So she was prompting him during the call. He also was having difficulty holding the phone so that he could hear and talk at the same time, so holding the phone in the right place. And um, we actually, along with this video, saw many different examples of the challenges that kids have uh, talking on the phone. So there's several different types of challenges. First of all, cognitive challenges, remembering to hold the phone up while you're talking, gesturing to things in the environment that cannot be seen by the remote party. Um, just articulating clearly. A lot of these kids are just now learning to talk. It's very hard for the remote party to understand what they're saying. There's also social challenges. So these challenges include just like understanding the art of conversation. Uh, they don't know how to do turn taking. They're not very good at asking questions. Uh, they're not very good at storytelling yet. And so all these things really help uh, in a phone call. And then also, of course, there's attentional and motivational issues. And partly because of the way the phone works, a lot of the kids feel like it's a chore to talk on the phone. They're just not excited about talking on the phone at all. So they, they have difficulty staying engaged. And of course, this changes between different ages. So really young kids, like three years old, are just learning how to talk. And they just have a hard time understanding what the phone is and that it represents a person uh, on the other side, right? And then by age five, kids seem to be able to talk. They can have a conversation, especially face-to-face. -face. But kids that are usually talkative face-to-face -face regress to yes and no responses when they get on the phone. So, so they get really short all of a sudden. And then by age eight, kids can typically carry on a conversation on the phone. Sometimes they even initiate phone calls. Uh, but they still haven't quite mastered the art of conversation, but they're learning. They're getting there. So age eight, um, we actually start to see a lot of kids being gifted cell phones uh, by their parents or being allowed to have cell phones at that time. Um, so these families had a lot of different strategies to make the phone calls work. Um, and clearly, we saw a lot of parental scaffolding, like, for example, holding the phone up to the child's face, helping them with the phone posture. We saw families also scaffolding the remote party by talking with them before they would hand off the phone to the child, prepping them with conversation topics, uh, kind of coaching them on things to say to the child, questions to ask. Um, one of the things that was striking that seemed to work really well was silliness. And grandparents who use silliness seem to engage the child in a way that uh, was a striking contrast to, to children who were not engaged with silliness. So one of the parents would say, it's the typical thing. You say something totally inaccurate, and Kate says, no, I'm five. So you can tell they're saying, I hear you're turning 26. Or I hear you lost a finger. No, a tooth. And then you can get them started talking. And so another thing that seemed to, to work pretty well was this video calling. So two of the 18 families that we observed chose to use a video call to communicate with their remote loved ones. And this we thought was interesting and we thought needed more investigation. So we decided to do a whole new study specifically focusing on video calling and family communications. And so how does video change things? Right. 
One more. Here we go. <laughs> okay. So, so video really does help children engage, especially young children. It's you're talking to a face, albeit through a screen, but at least you can see that it's a person that you're talking to. So it's less abstract than talking on the telephone. Um, it, it supports all of these nonverbal communications like the Skype kisses that we just saw, but also like gestures and body language and facial expressions, all those rich communication tools that we use and learn to use as a kid are there. Uh, and then, you know, you can, you can show things through actions instead of describing things. It's also, um, you'll notice the whole family kind of on the couch there together. So it's really easy to include multiple parties, which simplifies scaffolding because the parents understand what's going on in the conversation. They can repeat things that the grandparents said that the children didn't understand. They can do all these things that are great. This could also be done with speaker phones on phones, but very, actually almost none of the parents that we did the phone call with used speaker <coughs> phone for whatever reason. And then um, it also kind of supports the conversation because you can, you can opportunistically create conversation topics through objects, like uh, parents would ask about things that the kids are wearing or tattoos on their, uh, fake tattoos on their cheek that they got at the carnival, things like that. So it supports being able to show rather than tell. So here's a good example of that. Um, how about the trumpet? Is everybody still practicing on it? Yeah. Yeah, you play. I guess there's no chance you play your trumpet parts too. Craig, you want to play your trumpet too? Uh, 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 uh. So, so video, you, you just can't do the same thing over the, over the telephone. But it does have its, its drawbacks. So every single one of the families that we visited uh, were not able to set up uh, video conferencing on their own. They required a visit, usually over a holiday period or something, from like the system administrator of the family to go and uh, set up the video conferencing. So somehow, even though we've gone a long way, it's still not quite there for a lot of families. Um, there's also a lot of, of social work that goes into video calls that doesn't quite go into phone calls. So like some people feel the need to get made up, to put on jewelry and makeup, to get dressed. That's important sometimes too. Uh, it also, they, they feel anxiety about how they're representing themselves. They feel like they need to straighten up the house and clean up a little bit. Even though a lot of people are using laptops for this, they, they typically were stationary during the, the video call. So it's still difficult to move around. Um, the, the video call application has to be running on both sides for you to be able to make a video call. So it still requires some coordination on both sides. Um, and then for, you know, it does require a high bandwidth connection, which is still out of reach for a lot of families. So. It can be expensive as well. So um, is video the answer? Uh, we think it's part of the answer. But uh, especially for young kids, I think there's still something missing. And here's, here's kind of an example of, of what that's about. Are you frustrated? Are you frustrated? Are you frustrated? Yeah. What happened? Cat flax. The door birds that you use for a cat. Okay. I don't know whether you can hear the little snores, but cute little snores are coming from my daughter. So the kid actually fell asleep in the middle of the video call, right? So this just kind of is a sign that uh, she just wasn't engaged. Of course, there is a backstory to this. She didn't get her nap that day, so that's part of it. But uh, but you can tell she's clearly not engaged in this video chat at all. And, and part of that is that, you know, this, you can't really have a conversation with the young child. You have to play with them. You have to find ways to play with them 
um, through these communication technologies. And that's uh, one of the things that we're trying to do with our work. So how might we create products for the family and not an individual user? So you can't make things for children without thinking about the parents and the context of the family and the context of use. Um, how do we support cooperative play and learning where play and learning can be uh, synergistic in a lot of ways? Um, both co-located together, but as well as, as remote. And then how can we you know, focus on relationships rather than media, devices, or services? and help people create these shared memories that they can tell and <coughs> stories and these connections that they, they didn't have before. So um, after doing this research, this is where we hooked up with, with Sesame. And we were able to create this hypothesis about a synergy between young children's education. Uh, in this case, we're looking at a rich shared reading experience and communication at a distance. So can we combine family communication and at the same time support children's learning? So uh, that's kind of the motivation for this family story play project. And here's a quick video to give you a taste for what this project's about. Oops. How can children's media be coupled with communications technologies to improve both children's learning and long-distance family communication? The Story Play project supports remote book reading between children, parents, and grandparents. Story Play combines traditional paper books with mobile video conferencing. Family members can see and hear each other and can also see what page their long-distance partner is viewing. The Sesame Street character Elmo offers ideas about the book that inspire conversations between children and grandparents. Can you say Elmo's name in a very loud voice? Elmo! <laughs> oh, God! <laughs> Can you say Elmo's name in a very soft voice? Elmo! <laughs> okay, so some of the design guidelines that we were thinking about here is uh, we really wanted to promote what's known as dialogic reading. So it turns out the research shows that the more kids talk about a book during a reading experience, the better their vocabulary development will be. So you really want to encourage kids to get into a dialogue about the book content while you're reading to them. Okay, and uh, that's one of the premises that we're basing the family communication plus <coughs> literacy on. Uh, we wanted to uh, kind of maintain the integrity of a children's reading experience at the same time, right? We wanted to use a physical book with physical pages. One of the things that is important for early literacy is just learning how to turn a page and where the front of the book is and the end of the book, uh, things like that. And we wanted it to fit into typical family reading rituals. So we made it portable and wireless so they could take it to bed with them and do bedtime stories, uh, things like that. So we also uh, wanted to provide some sort of shared context uh, to help with both sides coordinating what page they're on. Um, in addition, we wanted to make it accessible and playful so that not only young children could use it, but also elderly. So make sure that it's accessible to all these age groups. And uh, we wanted to kind of taking cues from some of our observations in the field, scaffold both children and grandchildren. So um, we wanted to make sure that they talked about things that were playful and supported these playful conversations. So similar to the way that grandparents were prompted about topics of conversation by their parents. We wanted the system to help support that in some ways as well. So um, the design really centers around this physical book, which uh, is augmented with uh, special magnetic tags. And then there's housing in the, um, in the device that can detect those tags to tell both what book is inserted as well as uh, what page you're on currently. So it knows what page you're on, it knows what book's in there. Then there's two screens. Uh, there's the video conferencing screen, 
which uh, of course is your view to the other side. And then there's Elmo. And Elmo is really like a third member of your video chat. He's, uh, he's there, he's listening to grandmother read the story, and uh, he's also kind of involved in the conversation. Um, so these two systems connect over Wi-Fi, and so there's one on each side, one for the grandparents, and one for the, uh, the kids and the parents. So we specifically designed this for the co-located parent to be involved, right? So there's the kids reading with the co-located parent on one side and the grandparent on the other. And uh, just to give you an idea of the shared context, so we use the page information. You can see when I turn the page on one side, uh, the page icon updates to show you what page I'm on. So that helps coordinate uh, the page turns. And then um, Elmo, his role in this experience is really as, first of all, for the children, like modeling an interest in reading. So if the children see that Elmo is interested in the book, they're going to be interested in the book too, right? So he's listening along with this story. And Elmo's, I mean, part of it is, like, he's really a, a rock star to these kids, right? Like, they see Elmo, and they're like, oh, my gosh, it's Elmo, right? So they really get excited when they see him. And then Elmo also has an important role to play for the, the parents and the grandparents. And his role, he basically asks questions. And through asking questions, he's modeling these dialogic reading techniques. So getting the kids to talk about the book, and parents are learning by watching kids talk to Elmo about the types of questions that they could ask to get the kids to talk more. And one of the ideas that we kind of hope happens, but we haven't actually studied yet, is that parents who engage with this system are likely to transfer these dialogic reading uh, practices to normal books as well. But we, we haven't had a chance yet to look at that. So here's an example of what Elmo would say. Whoa! Grover's tying the pages together. Elmo is learning how to tie his shoe. Hmm? What kind of things do you like to tie? What kind of things do you like to tie? Right? And so the kids get started talking and then, the, you know, you can bloom into a conversation there, potentially. But on every page, Elmo has specific dialogue that's uh, scripted for that page to make it relevant as if he's listening along in the story. Um, another thing that we did to help parents and grandparents, or this is specifically for grandparents actually, so it's on the remote reader side of the experience, we created many different tips to help scaffold this dialogic reading process. So first of all, we have a five minute video of Maria from Sesame Street who goes through ten different tips um, kind of illustrating these dialogic reading principles and how to use them. But then we also, in the book, so during the context of the reading experience, created these dialogic reading flaps. So they were flaps that you could kind of turn up on the page and it would give you a tip and a specific example of how to use that tip on that particular page. So it would kind of walk grandparents through some of these dialogic reading techniques. Did yeah. Did Maria record that specifically for you all, or was this something that she has generally available about dialogic reading? This was uh, this was recorded specifically for this project. Also, the the Elmo dialogue was recorded specifically for this project. Um, but the Maria video in particular was recorded in a way so that they could use it for other purposes later. So they, they had in mind, they recorded it for this project, but they wanted it to make it generic enough where they could use it, for example, in one of their television shows or something like that. Yeah? So how did you avoid that emo is talking all with grandparents? Uh, that's a good question. I'll come back to that in just a second. Yeah. Backing up from that, so, so you've introduced the three parties. Yeah. Did, did you consider breaking up, not, not sort of confounding the introduction of, of, of the other two parties? If, if you examine the, the sort of dyadic relationship there between child and Elmo, child and Elmo, 
That's also a good question. We, we really took uh, a pretty big leap with this project. There's a lot of things that are new that are kind of confounding, and we're we'll try to break it apart a little more later. But we really wanted to kind of go as far out as possible with this project at first. And then you'll start to see us stepping back a little bit to kind of understand the nuanced interrelationships between the different uh, factors. But with this project, we were really trying to design what would be the ideal experience for children and really include all of those features at once. Um, OK. So, um, so we designed a study to look at how we were doing with this project, where we compared uh, reading books over Skype to reading books with family story play. Um, the goal was really to kind of understand their relative strengths, understand the benefits of Skype and the benefits of family story play, but also to help inform the design of future iterations of the story play system. So we, we did a lab-based study. So basically, we brought an entire family, grandparent, parent, and kid, into our offices over on Page Mill and uh, split them up so that the grandparent was in one conference room and the kid and parent were in a different conference room and then had them uh, try both of the systems, uh, the family story play as well as the um, Skype. Now, it turns out, uh, through the course of the study, we realized that the, uh, the second session, we, we basically we balanced ordering for the study so that they would you know, experience one system first and the, the next system next. And always the kids were just way too tired for the second session, no matter what book it was or what system it was. So we had to throw out all the second sessions and it ended up being a between group study um, just because kids were too tired to read the second book. But um, we got some really interesting results. So, so it turns out that just introducing a book to the video conference experience, both for Skype and for family story play, ended up in much longer interactions. So the average reading time for both were about seven to nine minutes. But one outlier on the family story play uh, condition read as long as 24 minutes for this 11 page book. So that was a really significant uh, reading session for a four-year-old girl. And this, you know, just keep in mind, this is compared versus the typical calls and video calls that we saw in the other condition were really short. Um, one of the, the striking positive things that we saw is that children and parents demonstrated much higher levels of enjoyment for family story play. So coding for laughter and smiling uh, children and parents laughed and smiled a much higher percentage of their time with family story play than with Skype. Interestingly, though, uh, with grandparents, they seemed to have equal enjoyment for both. So there were really high enjoyment on both systems. I think they just loved the idea of seeing their, their grandparents or their grandkids on the other side. So one of the quotes that from the study was, uh, story play was good because it helped interact towards the book. I know every time he saw the light bulb, he went to press the button, and he would actually listen to that a little bit, and he would be talking about the book. So it kind of demonstrates, that quote demonstrates that some of our goals around dialogic reading were starting to work, because parents were commenting on the fact that uh, they would be talking more about the book. So Elmo uh, really turned out to be somewhat of a mixed blessing. So he, 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 like I said before, he really does have this star power, so kids just really were drawn to Elmo. Uh, and they had really high engagement with him. So one of the kids, or one of the fathers put it this way. He said, Elmo, she loved it. You saw her. She tried to kiss him. Right? And then here's kind of an example of uh, how grandparents kind of learn to leverage Elmo to get the kids to talk a little bit. Did you hear what he said? So, so she was like, you know, did you hear what Elmo said? What do you think about that? Oh my God, she was really animated, and she, Elmo really worked for her. But then some grandparents really felt in competition with Elmo. Going back to to your question, 
about how do we make sure that they don't talk simultaneously. So one of the um, grandparents put it this way. He said, oh, I liked Elmo. I mean, he brought up questions that I wouldn't even ask. He's a good influence, but when he beats me to the punch, that was a little distracting. My grandson's not even looking at me, or I mean, I don't know if he was looking at the book. I think he might have been looking at Elmo over here, waiting for the ding or something instead of looking at the, the actual picture. So he was expressing kind of some frustration that Elmo was getting all the attention here and uh, the kids weren't paying enough attention to him. So, uh, so I think we have some work to do in this prototype with balancing attention towards Elmo versus attention towards the book and, and the grandparent. Yeah. Try and engage even your three-year-old when the TV's on. Right. Yeah, but El you keep in mind that most of the time Elmo was actually in an idle loop, kind of actively listening to the grandparent talk. But the kids, the way that this prototype worked is uh, for each page, uh, we kind of measured how long it would typically take to read the page. And then Elmo would have an idea after the page should have been read. And so his idea would show up and there would be like a ding and he would have a thought bubble. And you could touch the thought bubble to get Elmo to talk. We didn't want Elmo to directly start talking because we were afraid that he would interrupt. But it turns out the ding was pretty interruptive as it was because most kids would just immediately go and touch Elmo. Uh, you know, regardless of what their parents tried to do or, or uh, things like that. So, so yeah, so Elmo wasn't constantly talking like a television would be. So he, he did pay due attention to the grandparent, but uh, it still wasn't ideal. That's right. There was a role he played in pacing it, and he specifically tried to encourage discussion through his dialogue. Uh, I love the way we're anthropomorphizing Elmo. OK, so yeah, right, right, right. So um, yeah. control over when Elmo speaks? Um, so that's coming, too, in the next prototype. OK. All right, so uh, physical engagement. So one of the things that we were um, really excited about is that parents we're twice as likely to give kids control of the book pages in Family Story Play versus Skype. So there's something about the Skype condition. I don't know. They, they typically would position the laptop so it was way out of arm's reach. And they would be the one that would like make sure that the kids were on the right page. But then in uh, Family Story Play, they were giving a lot more agency to the kids themselves. And here's a great example of how the physicality of the prototype led to some interesting interactions. Okay, no, no, don't fall, don't fall. Okay, ready? They turn the page. Oh man, what happened? Did it fall down? No, I fell down. What happened, Gabriel? No, that's too quick. Are you gonna fix it? Uh huh. Yeah. You're gonna build it again? Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay, we have to do one brick at a time. Mm -hmm. One brick, stand it on top of another. No, you're fixing it? And he's fixing it. You're building it? Oh, good job. Oh, are you fixing it? Oh, man, I think oh. you need it. Do you have a hammer over there, Gabriel? Mm, I do. So th I think this is a great example of how kind of the technology bled into the background and they were really just playing together with the book at a distance. And uh, one of the things that's striking about this example is it really demonstrates the importance of the parental scaffolding. I don't know if you noticed, but the mother was really subtly verbalizing the child's actions by asking the child questions so that the remote grandparent would be aware of what's actually going on. OK, so uh, kind of to summarize this family story play prototype, we were really supporting this idea of story time over a distance, um, children and parents reading books together over mobile video chat, 
and really encouraging kids to, to have dialogue around the book contents so that families could feel closer together, they'd have something to talk about. So it kind of has these synergies between children's learning and family togetherness. But we're, there's still a lot of unanswered questions with this prototype. So um, first of all, how would connected reading perform in the wild? We actually go into an ecologically valid context in the homes. Would people still use something like this? Also, how, how would usage trend over time? Are there novelty effects at play here? We just had a really short lab study. And then what aspects of story play experience were most effective at promoting children's learning and family togetherness? So going back to your question, how do we untangle all the new things that we've kind of introduced here to understand what's at play? And then also, um, e-books are getting pretty hot. Would this work with e-books? What, what happens if we take away the physical book? Would it still work? So uh, the next prototype, Story Visit. You can actually, this is a live public pilot. You can go try it out today, www.storyvisit.org. Sign up, hang out with your, uh, with your distant relatives. And uh, you'll see a lot of familiar themes. There's still the book. There's still video conferencing. There's still Elmo. Uh, there's actually, up at the top, you'll notice uh, tips that could, you can click on for the grandparents. Uh, but there's, there's a couple new features. Um, the pages are automatically synchronized. So when one side turns the page, it automatically turns on the other. There's shared touch. So if I click on the screen, um, I can say, what's that? And then my finger will show up on the other side. Uh, and then we've added uh, controls for Elmo. And these controls are only visible on the uh, grandparent side. So the kid can touch Elmo, and Elmo will laugh. But only the grandparent can make him talk about the book or uh, say these things. So in, in some ways, the grandparents kind of facilitating, could facilitate an imaginary conversation with Elmo. So you could say, Elmo, are you ready to turn the page? And then click yes, yes. Right? Or Elmo, are you scared? No, no. Right? This is browser-based, browser yeah. Uh, we, have, we have issues with all browser support. It's a prototype, but definitely works with WebKit-based browsers um, and Firefox, I believe. We, anyway, we're working really hard to get it work on all browsers, and maybe, maybe we'll have that soon. Um, so it's also, with this prototype, a lot easier to swap out the titles. So you can just click from a digital library what title you want to read, um, and that automatically updates on both sides. OK, so uh, kind of a taste for what it's like to use Story Visit. When some family members are just too young to engage in a phone conversation or video conference with long-distance family members for a long time, how can we engage everyone in a shared activity that is just fun for each other? Yay! We're all going to read a book together! <laughs> Story Visit is designed for young children and long-distance family members to connect and share fun moments by reading storybooks together using video chat. Family members and children can share the same book using a web browser on their computer. When the reader turns the page, the children see the same page. Children or the reader can point to something on the page, and the other members in the video conference can see where they are pointing to. Elmo can also participate in the storybook reading activity by the reader controlling Elmo with four simple buttons. The reader can trigger Elmo to make comments that are specific to each page, make him laugh, or answer the reader and children's questions with a yes or a no. Children do not see the control buttons. So here's the children's screen here. It's missing the controls and tips. Readers can engage in a rich reading experience with children by using page-specific tips that are designed to help dialogic reading. 
Each page has specific tips that are only shown to the readers. Our goal with this project is to connect long distance family members and young children by providing emotionally rich remote interactions using a combination of today's communications technologies. Our research with over 60 families showed a significant increase in conversation time between young children and remote family members compared to traditional video conferencing or phone conversations. Okay, so uh, we decided to, to evaluate this as a public pilot. So we actually opened it up and had families sign up. We had uh, around, in the time period that we were doing the study, we had over 200 families uh, sign up for this study. And um, actually only 61 ended up using it uh, for family communication, 61 families. So that's what we focused on in our study. And we did four to six weeks of home use and we split families up randomly based on their sign up in four different conditions to try to isolate the different features of the design to understand how they impacted uh, the experience. So one condition had Elmo only, another condition had only the dialogic reading tips, no Elmo, another condition had both Elmo and the dialogic reading tips, and another condition had just the book with the video conferencing, no Elmo, no tips. Okay. And we had, uh, for all of these conditions, five different book titles to choose from. So they had, these were all Sesame titles that they allowed us to use for this experiment. And uh, we followed up with the families through surveys and phone interviews. And we took four of those families and uh, observed them in the home. Uh, so we have some data, like this picture up to the right, where we actually watched them using that in, in the wild. So um, some of the findings, content is key, right? And so the average reading time was 11.7 minutes, which is a little bit of an increase from family story play and, and still really impressive for the two to five year olds that we were focusing on. Um, and the reading session times almost doubled for the Elmo only condition. So when Elmo only was in there, uh, there was a really significant difference, st statistically significant difference. So Elmo, that 11.7 is all of the conditions average? That's right. And do you, do you know off the top of your head what the Elmo only was versus the without Elmo, roughly? So um, I didn't want to go into too much detail on that. It was like, it was basically almost 20 minutes uh, for, the, for the Elmo only. I didn't put a chart in here because this is actually uh, under submission to, to Kai. Here. So I only wanted to go over kind of like the high level details. But another thing that's, um, that's really interesting is uh, the usage peaked for three-year-olds. So if we looked at an analysis of the age of the child and how much the system was used, three-year-olds were higher for average reading time first per session, total reading time across reading sessions, and total number of pages read. And so the, the age groups that we broke it down into were under three, so one and two year olds, three year olds, four year olds, and then five and over. And there was a significant peak for three year olds. And this is, in some ways, kind of a demographic sweet spot for this age is in some ways understandable, in some ways surprising. So it's understandable in the sense that um, the content was specifically designed for two to four year olds. All of the book content, the Elmo character, all that is really targeted to that two to four year old age group. But it's also kind of surprising in that uh, only limited lab trials have indicated that sustained distance communication is even possible with children this young. So uh, I think it's really kind of interesting that there is a system out there where usage peaks for three year olds. That's this one. So uh, one of the comments here is, uh, I like the different choices and the fact that Elmo can ask comprehensive questions on each page. It would be great if he could have more than one question comment for each page. My son really liked to say, let's hear what Elmo says after his relative finished reading each page. OK. So um, 
Tips. Tips were interesting because um, if Elmo was present, the tips were almost not used at all. Elmo completely overshadowed the tips. But uh, when it was tips only, the tips were actually really useful. So here's an example of some of the, the attitudes towards tips. You changed the page, Rafa. Oh, good job. Good work. Ernie's, mmm, tasty twiddle bug logs and Bert's boats. Just some context. Oh, it looks kind of like At the end of one of the books, it there are yeah. recipes. Yeah. Rafa so they're talking that. about some of the recipes. Right now. But, so, Rafa, what part of these boats should you not eat? Fruit leather. <laughs> that was one of the questions I suggest. Uh, What's that? Oh, it's oh, it suggests it suggests a question to you. Uh -huh. Oh, I didn't know it was telling you what to read. <laughs> well, like that question about what the fireworks sound like. I wish I had thought of that myself. But oh, oh, really? I'm going to turn oh, the page. Okay. Says offer general and specific praise and encouragement. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you mean, you mean this hasn't really been you? <laughs> That's good. No, it's well, good. Some it's kind of, it's helpful. So, so the CNN headline is, Elmo beats our grandma. <laughs> yeah, well, this, this family doesn't have, this is a tips only condition, so there was no Elmo in this condition. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I, liked, I liked the description of these are how to be a good aunt instructions, right? That's how she perceived the tips. And so uh, for these families, the families that didn't have Elmo, it, it, it really seemed to help. But in the, in the Elmo plus tips condition, uh, for some reason it got overwhelmed. And what's interesting, I, I kind of glazed over this in the, in the other slide, but it was only El Elmo only that had a significantly higher uh, reading time. When Elmo plus tips were there, uh, there was actually no significant difference compared to the other parameters. And we're not quite sure what's going on there. The data didn't really say clearly or definitively what was going wrong. But one hypothesis would be that uh, both at the same time kind of overwhelmed the reader and they weren't able to make use of each appropriately. And just focusing them on one of those two helped them to leverage that. OK. Yeah. Did you ever let one of the groups that had tips only add Elmo later and see how they reacted to that? So yes, we did. After the study was over, after the four to six weeks, we enabled all of the features, the tips plus Elmo, for all of the, the families. But we haven't actually examined yet how that's changed usage. Um, that, has, that wasn't part of this. But we, we have enabled that. We just haven't finished going through that data yet. Yeah? Did we record? Like, um, like grandparents can say things through animal's mouth. Right, yes. We did uh, measure how many times uh, grandparents clicked on Elmo and how many times they triggered Elmo to talk. Um, we measured that. We logged it. Is that what you mean? No. Oh. I see what you're saying. So basically, kind of do a voice conversion of grandma to Elmo. This is actually a very sensitive topic for Sesame. Because they, uh, they are very protective of Elmo and what Elmo is allowed to say and how Elmo is portrayed <laughs> and we actually it took us a, a lot to get them to to agree to yes and no actually uh, because you know conceivably somebody could uh, portray Elmo in a negative light if those were misused um, so that's that's actually uh, Elmo is is has to stay in character yeah Yeah, well, so in that light, the next prototype is going to get into some of that where you'll see grandma actually being superimposed into the book. Okay, so there, uh, we're coming to that too. Okay.
Um, so, so one of the a couple of the things that are significant about um, Story Visit is it really creates this synchronized and symmetric perspective. So you'll notice uh, that the the video window is not like a tradi traditional video chat. It's actually both videos are the same size. And that's because children have difficulties imagining other people's perspectives, and so these. Uh, these things are all made so that it looks exactly the same on both sides so that uh, no matter what side you're looking at, you have a clear idea of what the other side is seeing. Also, uh, throughout this project, we got constant requests for touch screens. Uh, children just don't know how to operate mice or touch pads. They want touch screens. And so parents reported that kids were touching on the screen. So you can imagine that with these uh, camera-enabled tablets will have a, a, a nice platform for applications like this. Um, also, you know, content structures activity and layers of content can be used flexibly uh, by the adult. So families really cited content as a major factor in their use of the system. And so we need larger content libraries, more books, we also think that we need to allow families to add their own content uh, to expand the usage of the system. So to make it more expansive and also more personally meaningful and also um, make it more suitable for different age groups. OK. So uh, moving on to the last prototype, people in books. Okay, and this is, this is really kind of an early stage exploration. We're continuing to work on this, but this is a taste of uh, our next ideas on connected reading. Anne grew until his ceiling hung with vines and the walls become the world all around. What do you think, Alyssa? This, this one doesn't feel like we are separated. We, I feel like I'm more close with uh -huh. Alyssa. <laughs> and an ocean tumbled by with a private boat for Max, and he sailed off through night and day. Okay, I see his name. Right? What his name? Max. Really? A, -A, 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 -A Yeah. Oh, good. Who is this guy, Alisa? Max. Yeah. Do you like him? You think so? Okay. And. Okay. So here we're uh, like projecting families to be part of the book narrative and putting them in the context of the book so that they can play through being in this special place together. Um, and uh, like she said, it really makes you feel like you're being transported to a common place uh, instead of uh, reading to each other at, the, at a distance. Um, so the mother said, this is a great way to read, attached to the story, to communicate. I can do this even here at home. And her daughter agreed. When I'm sleeping in a different bed, mommy can still read from the computer. Um, so uh, I think the, what's interesting here is that they, they want to do this at home even without a distant partner. Here. And, and I, think, um, I think that's important. And then also she says, you're in a picture book. And pe people naturally like to be in this unusual setting. So you're being projected to a new place. And people like that aspect of this design. And so kind of looking more broadly uh, at reflections and, and design guidelines from our learnings from all three prototypes, um, you really need to create a fun and playful UI. And this goes back to you can't have a conversation with children. You really have to play with them. And that has to be embodied in the UI. You have to be able to play through the interface. Um, you also want to, like the last comment that we saw, design for offline use too. Uh, there's nothing like the bummer of getting all prepped for uh, reading with, with Grandma and Elmo, and then Grandma's not home. Right? How do you cope with that? So you still have the way to kind of gracefully degrade back to uh, just reading with, with the parents. So it's got to be as much fun in a co-located space as it is at a distance. 
Um, you also don't just design for the kid. Make sure the co-located parent is in, in, involved in your design as well, because it's got to be fun and engaging for the co-located parents so that they'll be with the child and support them through that experience. Because parents are typically the gateway as to whether or not children engage with these technologies. And they're responsible for the coordination with their distant relatives and things like that. And also, um, we really want to highlight these synergies between family communication, emotional expression, and child development. All of these things, kids benefit from interacting with adults in ways that we don't really fully understand. So the more interaction we can get them with adults to express these emotions and to play and to, to read together, the better off we'll all be. So I'm going to go back to a previous slide. Uh, how might we create products for the family and not an individual user? Um, how might we support cooperative play and learning? And how might we focus on relationships rather than media devices or services? And I think with these projects, we're really just scratching the surface. I think there's a lot of potential, even beyond shared reading, for things that we can do to help families feel more connected. OK, and then I'm going to leave you with a reading list. These are some of the publications that have resulted from this work. You can tell that this has been a, a really long, concerted group effort. So it's over two years of research that's coming to fruition right here. And we're, we're hoping to do more. So thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. You did a lot to improve the book. Did you do anything to improve the video conference? My plug lessons that it's the same technology, but it's so much better. Yeah. Uh, no, that's a really good point. Um, video conferencing. Yeah. So the question is, it seemed like we did a lot to improve the reading experience, uh, but what about improving the quality of the video conference itself? And uh, the answer is um, we're trying to do more. But it actually, what's interesting is the, um, the transition from the device-based video conferencing to the web-based video conferencing act actually resulted in a degradation of video conference quality for us, especially in terms of audio. Because uh, the echo cancellation, we were using a flash media server, and the echo cancellation is just horrendous. It's uh, server-based video, not peer-to-peer -peer video. Although I think they're working on fixing that. It's just it's not quite there yet. And, uh, and that was a problem. And in fact, a lot of the families learned to mute the audio through the video conference and have just a phone on speakerphone. Um, and that's how a lot of them got through the echo problems from the video conference. So clearly, uh, higher quality video conferencing would work. Actually. I didn't mention this, but I probably should have. In the original StoryPlay prototype, where we compared um, the family StoryPlay to the the Skype, reading books over Skype, the grandma or the grandparents pretty much universally commented that they liked the bigger screen of the Skype prototype. Like they could see their kids much better in this large screen, and that's something that they wanted. So. Somehow, um, you could imagine designing an asymmetric design where you really kind of focus on the large screen for the grandparents and focus on kind of graspability and portability for the kids. Yeah. yeah um, that's a two question. One of us, all here, you know, and many families are uh, national, and many are temporary residents or immigrants. As one with, 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 with a child, we speak on, on Skype all the time. Have you, like, as the research uh, research uh, subjects, have, have they been like uh, people that are trained on video video calls? And, uh, um, you know, I, I guess the, the, this type of population uh, is more trained, or trained for it. Um, we, we didn't do any additional training, if that's, if that's what you mean. Like, we, we basically 
relied on their existing knowledge of, of video conferencing systems uh, for them to participate in the prototype. And actually, for uh, the story visit prototype, it was all voluntary sign up. We didn't recruit any of the participants. People just came and signed up. It was an open website. Um, so we had uh, very little control of who signed up. I, I know that my son plays that. I know that uh, he consumes like uh, books and and uh, and um, video me media like uh, TV or movies very differently, well, completely differently. I mean, uh, and one he's, he's involved in, it and the other is just it just stares at it. And uh, um, this is like a mix when you have like the animal figure on. It's like a mix of the two because uh, you don't know if he's if he's into the book or if he's just entertained by the by the character yes yes we have we, we actually refer to that as rich reading like if you if you think about the book an Elmo without the video conferencing you could imagine all kinds of uh, uh, designs with that we call that rich reading and we think there is a lot of potential for that especially uh, you know there's there's just all kinds of different ways that you can bring books to life and to make them more interactive and make them more interesting. And I think this is just kind of pointing in that direction as that having potential. But I think there's a lot more work to be done in that space too. Yeah. So you mentioned having the system degrade well in case the grandparent is not available for like reading. Um, right. Did you play around with different ways in which the reading session might be initiated? So like with the physical book prototype, could the kid have the book in the room and decide they want to read and just push a button and then if grandma's there they could just start or do we always have to rely on like offline like the, the mom or dad sets up with grandma or grandpa when the reading time would be and go that route yeah we never we never quite got the physical prototype to the point where um, you could actually deploy it in the in the home and and make it work so there's there's a lot of questions about like how it would actually go into sleep mode or how it would receive a call if it was like up on the shelf or uh, that we kind of glazed over with our lab-based study. Um, uh, we, we did play around with it in this sense where um, I didn't talk about this because I didn't have time, but we actually, the way the website worked is we didn't have this notion of calling the remote parent. It was kind of a, a shared chat room space. So you just had to both log in at the same time. And there was no way to select who you wanted to participate with. It was just who logged in. There was a shared family account, right? And that there was several advantages to that. One is that the grandparents didn't have to set up their own account. The parent could just set everything up and send the credentials over. There was no uh, need to dial something. You were just there, right? A lot of people still felt the need to coordinate over phone call, uh, but uh, you could imagine having like a specified time where you meet as well. Um, so we have also been looking, I have a video of Hayes um, using the physical prototype with his two daughters, uh, where he's just reading the book to them in person with Elmo augmenting the conversation. Maybe I can pull that up uh, real quick. Hold on. Just to embarrass you, Hayes. Um, let me see. OK, here we go. Is Elmo scared of monsters, too? Yeah, he is. Uh-oh. And me too. Yeah. Me too. Oh, look, you are all scared of monsters. Should we turn the page, Elmo? I don't think so. Okay. <gasps> no, turn the page! <laughs> look at he's so silly. What did you say? 
He said that, I think he said that Grover's unhappy. Sometimes my mom and dad though, and my sister Annika, um, sometimes I clean up the mess, and sometimes I clean up the mess, and sometimes my mom and dad. Uh oh, there's a mess here. Speaking of messes, we could clean up this mess right now. Too bad. They said too bad. Too bad. Do you have a sister or brother? Alma, do you? Alma doesn't do that. No. You know what she can do? She can tickle Alma if he touches Tommy. Oh, you made him dance. <laughs> Alma, you want to So it's clearly working pretty well in the co-located uh, space. I mean, Hayes is, is admittedly an expert. He knows. He knows how to leverage Elma, but uh, um, I think it I think it actually degrades pretty well to reading together. Uh, I guess implicit in that question is also just does it make sense for the kid to do it by himself, right, instead of with the co-located parent? And um, that's it. Kind of goes against. Uh, part of our design philosophy with this. Um, like one of Sesame's big values is actually a co-viewing. So they actually design their shows so that parents will watch with their children. And, uh, and that's something that's kind of embodied in our prototypes here as well. Um, we could have had Elmo read the books to the children, but I think that would have lost a lot of what this prototype's about. Yeah. These are all using the technical third picture books rather than chapter books. That's right. Um, and, there's, and there's the notion of you're, you're, you're piggybacking in a sense right there on, on a broadly understood, a broadly shared set, set of characters. Yeah, they are our extra. That's right. How, how would you see this going further, both into primarily textbooks where, where I mean, in the sense that the, this is almost a visually guided activity uh, structure. Uh, if it's moved into more text-based uh, stories, how does interaction play in there, in particular as, as you get into public domain stuff? Yeah, I think, I think there's um, something really interesting about uh, people in books with that uh, respect. Like you could imagine um, uh, a tutor um, helping with a uh, science um, book or something and, and kind of walking through. Uh, we were actually talking to one of the parents who, who was an online tutor. He was like, man, I wish I had something like this so that I could use with my tutors where you can kind of scan in their homework and walk through their homework together with them or uh, see how they're uh, formulating their equations things like that. So yeah, there, there's clearly a lot of potential with these types of shared, connected reading systems for uh, teacher-student interactions for older students as well. Another uh, thing that was suggested to us was um, helping uh, kids who are sick in the hospital and, and using a system like this to connect with the classroom. Um, so I think there are, uh, especially as you get into older age groups, a lot more opportunities for different types of uh, textbooks-like experiences. Keep going here, Ron, if you want to ask any more questions. Thank you. Okay. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.